Uh, if you are new here uh, uh, today, I began a new series last week entitled Heaven Matters. And uh, we looked at the place called heaven. What is heaven like? What is Jesus doing in preparing a place for us? And today, uh, I want to look at the idea of our body. Where do we go after we die? What do we do? And we're going to look at it from uh, Paul's perspective in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Next week, we will talk about the new Jerusalem, new heaven, in Revelation chapter 21. And so today, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, heaven matters because everything will be better. Heaven matters because everything will be, ma- will be better, and that is a great thing. Now, we have to first understand, before I begin to talk about really what our new bodies and our heavenly bodies will look like and what will happen the moment we leave this earth and pre- are presented to God, we have to look back and remember what is the key to everything, the only way Heaven really matters is if you are in Christ Jesus. Look at what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. And I'll tell you what we're going to do today. Uh, I don't know, I'm going to kind of move through the sermon pretty quickly. Uh, I don't know if uh, y'all didn't believe when I said text in your questions that I would answer the questions. I didn't know if y'all believed that. But after I answered a few at the end of last week's sermon, all of a sudden y'all bombarded us with questions. So at the end of the sermon today, I'm going to push on through the sermon. Uh, Bo's going to come out. We're going to sit down, and we're just going to go rapid fire one question after another, and we'll get to as many as I can, all right? So we're going to push on through. But heaven only matters if you understand 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and following. Look at what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, picking it up, verse 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... The new creation has come. Now, here is the key. Therefore, if. Those two letters put together if. The biggest question for you that you have to answer today is not, what does the heavenly body look like? Where is heaven? How quickly can I get there? None of those questions matter. If you haven't answered the if. If anyone is in Christ. Have you settled that question? The Bible is pretty clear that says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us, every one of us, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says, but God demonstrated His love toward us and that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Then the Bible says, for the price tag of sin is death. Well, what did Jesus Christ do on the cross? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, who can receive that gift? The Bible says, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is the plan of salvation. And so notice what Paul says. He says, if anyone, if anyone, remember what Jesus said. He said, for God so loved who? The world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever, anyone, whoever believes in Him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. What's the key? It's believing. Have you ever come to a place in time in your life where you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? If so, then everything I say after this point matters. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, then I want you to know that nothing matters until you make that decision for Jesus Christ. But notice what Paul said. He said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. What does that mean? The old, my old sinful nature, my old separated nature from God, my old nature that was condemned because of my sin, the wages, the price tag of my sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. The old is gone. The new is come. What is that? The life in me, the spirit of God in me that is completely and totally forgiven of all of my sins. The new is here. Then he says, verse 18, and all of this is from who? It's from God who reconciled us to himself through who? There's that word again, Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, once I have received Forgiveness of sins, the reconciliation, that word reconcile means to make up. In other words, my sin separated me from God. God, through His Son, 
reconciled me to him if I have faith in Jesus. And he says, God now has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. There's the word. How was the world, how am I, how are you reconciled to God? Through one person, Jesus Christ. How did he do that? Because of Christ's death, not counting people's sins against them. Well, how could God still be holy and not count my sins against me? Here's the answer. Jesus paid for them. Remember when Jesus hung on the cross, he looked up at the Father and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Remember what, what happened when Jesus hung there on the cross? A, a few verses later, he looked up into heaven and used the Greek word te telestai, which is translated in the English with three little words. It is finished. That Greek word te telestai translated it is finished is actually an accounting term. It's almost as if it's a stamp stamped with three, these three words. When it looks at the price tag, the debt of my sin, Jesus said, paid in full. Not a down payment. Paid in full. So that's why God, when I have faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, doesn't count my sins against me because they've already been paid for by someone else. Boys, we move into the Christmas season. What do we all do? Uh, we wake up and our kids run to, uh, run to the Christmas tree and they look. And if they're old enough to read, they want to read, this is for who and this is for who and this is for someone. They want to know, what are those gifts that are for me? And you usually, what? You usually with your kids have to say, no, don't open them now. No, don't open them now. No, don't open them now, right? But it seems like far too often, People sometimes go to church and they hear the gospel message and they hear the truth of Scripture and they say, you know what, another day, another day, another day, a different day, another day. You know, maybe I'll come back another day. I want you to know today is the day of salvation. And he says, not counting people's sins against them. And listen to this, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. What is our message as a church? It is singularly focused. Since we have received the message of reconciliation, our message to all the world is a message of reconciliation. So it all starts there. If you want heaven to matter, Christ has to matter first. Now, if you have taken care of the if and you've trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, let me give you seven truths of what makes life better here on this earth. I'm going to move through them, and then we'll do kind of a lightning round, is what uh, we're going to call it, a lightning round uh, of your Q&A on heaven. Seven truths that make life better, all right? Truth number one, talk about our future. Our heavenly bodies will be better. How many of you, let me ask you a question, would love a better body. Be honest. How many of you would love a better body? We all do. Well, the good news for those who are in Christ, you're going to get a better body. Not a little better, a whole lot better. You're going to get heavenly abs. Those are going to be awesome. We all want a better body. Man, we're going to look so good. Here's the beauty. When we get to heaven, we can eat all the Oreos, me, and all the banana pudding, me, all the bluebell ice cream, me, that I want, and I will still have a heavenly looking body. Now, I know what you're thinking to yourself, Pastor. There aren't going to be Oreos, banana pudding, and bluebell in heaven. Oh, yes, there is. <laughs> because Scripture makes it very clear that God will withhold no good thing from those who love him. And let me tell you, even in my sinful nature, I know those are good things. All right? Well, let's talk about this heavenly body. Notice what he says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know, everybody say, we know, that if this earthly tent, what's he talking about? He's using an analogy of an earthly tent. Our body is what he's talking about. This earthly tent that we live in, 
is destroyed and it is being destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Here is the good news. As our bodies disease and decay and wind down and mess up and get brittle and and struggle and they ache, at the same time, we know when this earthly tent finally goes away, I have a heavenly body, a physical body, one that is made for me in heaven, not made with human hands. So listen, first off, our future, our heavenly bodies will be better. And everybody says, (laughs) amen. All right, number two, what about our present? That's our future. Our accommodations are lacking and temporary as long as we are here. Our accommodations are lacking and temporary. Now, notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. Meanwhile, what does that mean? Verse 1, we have a heavenly body. He goes, but meanwhile, until we get there, right? Until we get there, we groan. Everybody groan. All right, groan like you mean it. All right, that, some of y'all growled. All right, I understand. Children's stories. All right, as long as I'm in this body, I groan. I wake up and I realize, man, my knee hurts and my back hurts sometimes. I go work out and, man, I'm in good shape. As soon as I stop working out and I roll back in there, which will be sometime in January again, I I know that the next day, what am I going to do? I'm going to get up and I'm going to groan and I'm going to hurt, right? He says, listen, meanwhile, as long as we're in this tent, we groan longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Boy, we love the idea. If God would just give me my heavenly body now, imagine what I would look like. Verse 3, don't imagine. It says, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. Look at verse 4. It says, for while we are in this tent, earthly body, we groan and are burdened. Now, let me tell you something about tents. You go over to Cabela's, you go to Dick's, you go to, uh, uh, you go to Academy, you go to anywhere else where you shop for tents and stuff like that. Have you noticed that tents come in all shapes and all sizes? Some of them are bigger, some are little, some last long, some of them are cheap, some of them are pretty expensive. You know, it just seems like some of our tents are different, right? They're different. Some of them last longer. Man, some of them are, are, are really nice. Some of them are just, man, they're just there. They're different. He says, listen, we groan and are burdened as long as we're in this tent because, read on, he says, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed. Instead, what do we want to be clothed with? Our heavenly bodies. You know what Paul is insinuating, just like what you and I know? The reality of it is we know what Christ said. He says, man, let not your heart be troubled. We talked about this last week. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I come again someday to see you, to, uh, uh, to be with you, that where I am, there you may be also. We all know that. But aren't we, be, aren't we afraid of being unclothed? How many of us are fearful of death? Paul is being honest. We're we're afraid to be unclothed, but we want to be clothed instead. We do want to be clothed with our heavenly bodies, but we don't like the idea of being unclothed here on this earth, do we? What is he talking about? I can't wait to receive my heavenly body. I just don't want to die. That's exactly what Paul is saying. And notice what else he says. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Man, right now, he says, our future, we have a heavenly body. Right now, our tents, our bodies, our earthly dwelling places groan and are burdened. Here's a third thought right there, picking up verse 5. He talks about our security. He says, we live with an eternal guarantee. Remember, once we've settled the if question, the question begins uh, for many people is, Man, how faithful do I have to stay? How how little do I have to sin to keep my salvation? And Paul right here says we have an eternal guarantee. Once you've settled the if anyone is in Christ, Paul says we are all given a lifetime. Let me rephrase that. An eternal lifetime guarantee. 
Notice what Paul says. He says, now the one who has been fashioned, who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God himself. In other words, God is the author of salvation, who has given us the spirit as a deposit. What is that spirit that is a deposit? Who is that spirit? It's the Holy Spirit. What does the deposit mean? Guaranteeing what is to come. Once I trust Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, God places a deposit in me. We know Scripture says it is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, that is deposited in me, that seals me, that is my deposit for what? Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 says, He is the seal on me, the believer, until my next sin, until I miss church, until I struggle a little bit with an old sin that I thought I'd defeated, but it showed back up? No. He says, I have been sealed until the day of redemption. In other words, when you settle the if anyone question, it's always settled, folks. It is always settled. And that's why he says, who has given us, God gave it to us. The Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, verse 6, he's just talking about our security with this eternal guarantee. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, then we are away from the Lord. He says, for the believer, once you have settled the if anyone question, once you understand that this earthly tent will someday, although now it groans and is burden, will someday go away and it will be replaced by a heavenly body. He says there are only two places that the believer can be. We are either absent from the Lord and present in the body, or we are absent from the body and present with the Lord. Those are the only two places that a believer biblically can be. We are either here in this body and not with Christ in heaven, or we are with Christ in heaven, therefore we are not in this body. That's thought number three, our security. It's been deposited, it's been settled. Number four, what about our confidence? We will live a better life by faith. He says, listen, if you live your life by sight, by things that you see, by how you feel every day, by whether you feel this way or feel that way, or whether you see God or think God's meeting your needs or doing everything, I want you to know that's living by sight. You will enjoy life better. We will grow in life better if we learn to live by faith. What does Paul say in verse 7? He says, for we live by faith, not by sight. That means that, man, if my body's groaning, if my body's deteriorating, or if I don't see God moving, or something doesn't seem to be going my way, I I don't get the promotion, or I, I don't get the house I wanted, man, those are all sight things. But instead, I live by faith, trusting God and Him alone by faith. And notice what he says. He says, we are therefore confident, I say and would prefer, listen to this, to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Paul just acknowledges the truth. Man, have you ever just said, I wish the Lord would come back? You ever just, you ever just had one of those nights that you're just kind of beaten down and you're struggling? It's exactly what he's saying right here. So as long as we groan and we struggle, how do we live? We live by faith. Not by sight, trusting that God is going to work it all out. Here's number five. You ready? What's our goal? While we are in this uh, body, what's our goal? To please God both here and there. Write that down. To please God both here and there. This is exactly what Paul says. Look at verse 9. He says, so we make it our goal. Everybody say goal. We make it our goal. What is our goal? To please Him. Man, whether I'm at home in the body or present with the Lord, my goal, whether I'm here or whether I'm there, is to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it and with the Lord. My one goal, our goal as a church, needs to be to please God. Let me ask you a question. In these last seven days since we met in here last, how many times did the thought cross through your mind, God, let me please you today? 
with what I say, with what I do, with how I live, with who I share with, who, with who I deliver the message of reconciliation, how many times? That's our one goal. He says our goal is to please God here and there. Man, we have to have that heartbeat. We have to do whatever we can to please God. Here's number six. You ready? If that's our goal, what's our aim? Our aim, and this is an okay aim, to build up rewards in heaven. It is okay as a child of God to desire to build up rewards for yourself in heaven. Now, we don't earn salvation by good works, but we can store up for ourselves rewards by good works, by heavenly works, by earthly works. Now, here's what we understand. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 20, he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures here on this earth, but instead, he says, where, if on this earth, where moss can eat away, where rust can destroy, where thieves can come in and steal. If all we do is spend all of our life, all of our energy, all of our words, all of our relationships, and all of our money on building up things for ourselves here, he says those are worthless. Jesus said, instead, store up for yourselves rewards and treasures in heaven where moss won't eat them, rust won't destroy them, and thieves will never break in and steal them. So what's our aim? If our goal is to please Him, our aim is to build up rewards. Notice what Paul says. He says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may receive what is due us for the things we've done while in the body, whether they are good or bad. Now notice, we... The things that we have done here on this earth. What is the judgment seat of Christ? And I want to be real clear so you hear this. There are a lot of people believe and a lot of people that teach, and they misunderstand what Paul is saying here and what Paul is saying over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. A lot of people say that as believers, that we're going to stand before Christ, and he's going to weigh all of our good works and our bad works, and some of us are going to make it into our heaven because of our works, and we're going to have roll in there with sterling colors and lots of rewards. And others of us will just barely make it by the skin of our teeth, and we're going to smell a bit like smoke. You've heard that idea. Uh, there are others that, having been judged by Christ, they won't make it. I want you to know that is not what takes place at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is only judgment for believers in Jesus Christ. This is a judgment of those of us who have settled the if anyone question. Only believers will be here at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, there is a great white throne judgment that we will see at another time in another message where God deals with the unbelievers, those who have rejected him. But for us, right here, right now, what we need to understand is what is being judged is not me as the believer. At this judgment, my works are being judged. A lot of people misunderstand 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 to 15. If you go read it, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10 to 3, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 10 to 15. That what Paul says there is that we will all, when we make our journey to heaven, our listen to this word, our works will be judged. Our works, what's going to be judged? Everybody say the word works. 1 Corinthians 3. Our works will be judged. We have settled that we are going to heaven. Our works will be judged. What will they be judged on? Whether they are wood, hay, and straw, or whether they are gold, silver, and precious uh, stones. The fire will test them all. Some will burn up. And, we won't, and they won't make the journey. Others will be pr- proven pure and right. They will make the journey with us. Now, let me tell you the best human analogy that I can come up with at what is being talked about here, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 3, is if you are about to go on a flight, you're going to fly somewhere. Air travel for Thanksgiving was crazy, like set a record. We're expected to be close to that again over Christmas, setting a new record. So, you go down to Hope It Makes It Airlines. You buy a ticket. You show up. 
You are dragging your carry-on. You drag your carry-on up there. There's the little person, uh, the TSA guy that's sitting there. He looks at your driver's license, looks at your ticket, checks everything, initials it. You're that dude. Or you're that dudette. You may go through. So you walk through. They make you go up in a couple of lines, back and forth, back and forth. Then you get to another place. You can put your driver's license away. You have been sure. Then they say, we need, to put, need you to put your bags on the conveyor belt. You walk through. Why do you get to go through? You got the ticket. That's salvation. But they are checking the bags. What are they checking them for? Do you have the wrong things in there? Do you have too much liquid in the bag? Do you do this? And what do they do? They say, all this stuff's good. Or have you ever had this experience? Where they say, uh, who's got the green bag? Uh, can we talk to you for a second? Now, usually when they find something, what do they say? What do you want us to do with this? Okay. That's always kind of a silly question. Could you hold it here till I get back in a couple of days? You know what they're really telling you is we're about to throw this away if you want to carry on. What are they doing? They are checking the luggage. You can go on. If you say just keep the luggage, what happens? Go on. You've got a ticket, right? That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is talking about. Our works will be judged by fire. That which is gold and silver and precious stone, it's going to go on through. That which is wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to be thrown away. So listen, at the judgment seat of Christ, that is not where Jesus determines whether you're going to go to heaven or going to go to hell. That is not where Jesus determines whether your good works outnumbers your bad works, therefore you go to heaven or go to hell. What this determines is how many rewards you have built up for yourselves in heaven. In other words, have you spent your life building treasures for yourself on this earth, or have we also spent much of our time and much of our energy and much of our vocabulary and much of our thought and much of our sacrifice and much of our giving, building treasures for us in heaven? That's what this judgment is all about. Here's number seven. You ready? Our motivation. What's our motivation for being and having and delivering constantly and consistently the message of reconciliation? It's Christ's love. Christ's love compels us. Look at it. Paul says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live, that's us living, should no longer live for themselves. Who are we not supposed to live for? Ourselves, right? Ourselves. We are not supposed to live. If you live for yourself, you are storing up treasures here on this earth that will be burned up. They will not go to heaven with you. He says, who lives for themselves, but for him who died, listen to this, who died for them and was raised again. Look at verse 20. We are therefore Christ ambassadors. A lot of this political season, we're seeing a lot of political appointments, cabinet appointments, ambassador appointments, all of these things. Let me tell you what, every one of you, if you have settled the if anyone question, you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ delivering the message of reconciliation to everyone that you come into contact with as, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. But I want you to know, as beautiful as all of that sounds, none of that matters if you haven't settled the matter of trusting Christ.